Kondu, the magician. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The makers of White King Granulated Soap present for your enjoyment Chandu, the magician. Before our play begins, we would like to take a moment, and I mean just a brief moment, to say something that will help those who have clothes to wash. Our suggestion is that you use White King granulated soap. Put White King in your washing machine. If your husband happens to do heavy, dirty work, if his overalls and jumpers and work shirts have made you work and washing trouble, you'll not only like what White King does, you'll say, I love that soap. And your hands, the hands you'd like to keep young and lovely, how kind White King will be to them, the only hands you'll ever have. And listen, save White King box tops. You're going to want them for something you're going to hear about on this program. The moment is up. Now, on with Chandu, the magician. Frank Chandler, known in the Far East as Chandu the Magician, has unexpectedly returned from a long stay in India to the Beverly Hills home of his widowed sister, Dorothy Regan, her son, Bob, and her daughter, Betty. But Chandler does not know that all day Dorothy has felt a strange premonition of disaster. She forces herself to say nothing of it, even when Chandler produces a crystal ball and urges her to look into it with the others. They are shown a scene in India with Chandler on the deck of a houseboat talking with his teacher, the yogi. As they watch, Dorothy is overcome with terror. Chandu, the magician. like that, Mom. Let her alone, Bob. Uncle Frank, please do something. Please. There's nothing in the crystal now, Dorothy. See for yourself. Oh. Did I just imagine all that? Oh, of course not. We saw it, too. But that icy wind on the back of my neck. You must be unusually sensitive to these things. But if we really did see that... that picture in the crystal, why did it suddenly disappear? Because you were afraid. Bob, you may as well turn on the lights again. Okay. Too bad you had to get all jumpy, Mom, just when it was getting interesting. Frank, you said you looked in the crystal over in India and saw us here. Say, how did you know it was our house, Uncle Frank? You went to India before Mom and Dad built it, didn't you? That's true, but I knew it just the same. And I knew there was something like a dark cloud hanging over it. Why, that's just what Mother said. A storm gathering. Somehow, Dot, you felt it, too. At any rate, that's why I suddenly knew I must come back here. You don't mean you can look into the future? Well, that's too much to believe. No. At least I've never been able to yet. Dorothy, where are the plans of this house? Well, I don't know. Why? I'm trying to remember. Did Robert destroy them by any chance? Why, I don't... Oh, yes, I remember now. He burned them. I'd forgotten all about it. As soon as the house was finished. Did he ever tell you why? No, I didn't ask him. I was rushing around with decorators and gardeners and so on. You know how it is. <laughs> you don't, though, do you? There's no wife to follow you about, insisting on knowing whether you think the draperies match the rugs. <laughs> I see what you mean. What became of Robert's things, his books and so on? They're still in there, Frank. In where? In his room. Just as he left them. Nobody's ever been in there since Dad was drowned, Uncle Frank. Not even Mother, have mm, you? No. no. I see. Robert designed that wing of the house for himself, Frank. 
There's a library and a chemical laboratory and a small bedroom and bath. I almost never went in there, even before Robert went away. He didn't want me to. He said it might be dangerous. Well, why do you care about Dad's things after all this time, Uncle Frank? Because I'm sure it's time someone went in and looked through them. I know I should have done it long ago. First, I meant to. I thought I'd get rid of all the apparatus and the chemicals and perhaps sell the books, but I kept putting it off and... Well... I know. I suppose it was just a feeling that as long as Robert's things were there, he'd be coming back someday. That's childish of me. Mother, it is not. Well, at any rate, Frank, now you're here, we'll do it. In the next day or so, if you like. We must do it now. Tonight. Hey, what's the rush? Yes, after nine days, uh, or years, a day or so won't matter. I wish I were sure of that. What do you mean? Where's the door to that wing? Down the hall, to the right of the dining room. It's been locked all this time. And where's the key? Up in my room. Oh, I suppose I may as well face it now. Bob, run up and get the key, will you? It's in a little blue leather box on my dressing table. Sure, Mom. Oh, he'll never find it, Mother. He can never find anything. <laughs> All right, run along and help him look if you like. You can laugh, but you know how boys are. You're a drip. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Betty's a lot like you at her age, Dot. Is she? <laughs> you know, Bob's not in the least like Robert. No. Dot, do you think Robert might have built another room in that wing of his without telling him? Oh, well, of course he might have. He was so anxious not to have me know anything about that wing that I tried not even to look at it. I do know he had a great steel vault put in there somewhere. What made you think of that? I'll tell you if we find what I'm looking for. Well, shall we get started? I only hope it's not too late. Here's the key, Mother. It didn't take much hunting. He was right in plain sight. I'll give it to Uncle Frank. Oh, thanks, Betty. It's kind of weird going into rooms that have been locked up for almost ten years, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, wait a moment until I find the light switch. Oh, yes, here. Oh, look at the dust. So this was the library. Did Dad read all those books? Brother. Oh, I suppose so. Mother, over by the door. A big bronze statue. Oh, you're not kidding well, what's it supposed to be? It's a Buddha. Well, what would Dad want this thing for, Mom? Oh, it was given to him years ago in Singapore. Oh, it's a creepy thing, you know that? It kind of smiled at you, as if it knew a secret and wouldn't tell. Well, perhaps it does. Oh, hmm. now, wait a minute, Uncle Frank. Buddha seated on a pedestal covered with lotus blossoms. Might be... Well... Yes, it is. Oh, look, Bob, look. The statue's turning right around. Well, how did you do it, Uncle Frank? There's a concealed spring in one of these lotus flowers. The statue swings around. And there's a stairway under it. Yes, and that's what this light switch is for. It lights the basement room. Well, can't we come down? Yes, come along. And this is what Robert did with that steel vault, Dorothy. It's a filing room. <laughs> Buddha was certainly an ingenious way to hide the entrance. Mother, why would Daddy have all these rows and rows of filing cabinets? Well, you know he was a chemist, darling. Among other things. Well, I suppose I might as well start with the desk. Oh. Nothing seems to have been disturbed, though. No. Everything's covered with dust. Disturbed? How could it be? I don't know yet. I have the paper sometimes. Oh, it's in Robert's handwriting. Let me see. It's a letter. Or a part of one. Not signed. What's that name? Dear what? Bowden. Know who he was? Bowden, Bowden. Oh, yes. He was in Robert's class when he took that postgraduate course in Berlin. He was a scientist of some kind. What does the letter say? It says, Dear Bowden, despite our disagreement, I have often thought of writing you to ask you once more to give up your experiments. If they fail, you will have wasted precious time. If they succeed, you will have produced nothing but disaster for the entire world. What was this fellow up to, Dot? I haven't the vaguest idea. Go on, read the rest of it. Let's see. Even now, alone, I am on the verge of success. 
I beg you to give up those plans of yours which you know are unworthy of any scientist and join me. Well, that's all. Robert never finished it. That wasn't like him. You know what, Mom? What, Bobby? Well, well, maybe he didn't go to York at all. Maybe he had amnesia or something and just kind of wandered away. Oh, don't be silly. You talk like a comic book. Oh, of course he went to Europe, Bob. You know he sailed for home on the Athenia. Could he have heard from this Bowden before he left, Don? Well, if he did, he didn't tell me. Right, we'll just have to hope he left a record of what he was doing in one of these files. Does it make any difference where we begin? Yes, Bob, we'll begin here at this end. I have a feeling that... Well, hey, what's the matter? It... Is that it right off the bat? I think so. Oh, let's see. Oh, just a minute, Betty. Another thing. You'd better go back upstairs. Why? Because... Let me see what you have there. It's just a sealed folder with an envelope fastened to the outside. Is the envelope addressed to me? It may have been meant for you or for Robert's attorney. Well, then let me... Oh. To be opened at once in the event of my death. And I've left it here all these years. Now, don't blame yourself, Dot. No, Mom. If, if it's anybody's fault, it's Dad's. He knew you never came down here, didn't he? Oh, don't say that, Bob. But he's right, Mother. How could Daddy think he'd ever find it? I should have gone through everything. If only I hadn't let myself think he'd come home. Like the others who were found long after the ship went down. Well, why don't you open the envelope and see what's inside? Might not amount to anything now. You open it, Frank? Mm-hmm. Well, what is it? It's instructions about the contents of the folder it was attached to. Is it important, Uncle Frank? Yes, indeed. What did the instruction say? It says the sealed folder contains the drawings and formula of two discoveries Robert had just made. Oh, maybe this is the reason he didn't send that letter to Bowden. Hmm. Here, Doc. Read it for yourself. The results of these discoveries would be so terrible that I'm often tempted to destroy the records in my experiments. However, one man suspects their existence. So for protection, I shall keep these records as long as I live. But they must be destroyed at once at my death. I cannot accept the responsibility of giving such processes to an unstable world. Destroy the contents of the folder unread. Frank, what can it be? No one will ever know. Oh, are you just going to tear up the folder without even looking at it? I certainly am. Oh, but it's valuable. Your father knew what he was doing, Bob. He was doing, Bob. Now take it upstairs and burn it. Oh, I can't bear to touch it. Don't even want to know what it's about, Uncle. Wait Frank. a minute. The seal's been tampered with. Oh, it's impossible. We haven't touched I'll it. I'll have to open it now to make sure that... It's empty. Oh, no. Yes. I was right. We're too late after all. Before we bring to a close our drama this evening, may I say something to the ladies on the subject of hands? There is an extra special quality in White King Soap that is extra specially kind to hands. And I'll tell you what it is. If you use the kind of soap that needs hot, hot water to make it work, your hands are liable to be rough and red, no matter what kind of soap it is, or what claims are made for it, or what it contains. But listen, White King, with its nut and vegetable oils, doesn't need hot water. In washing machine or dishpan, for heavy clothes or filmy, fragile things, White King washes the dirt away in water that's just about body temperature. Ever hear of anything like that? No wonder millions and millions of ladies say, I love White King soap. That's what you'll say, too. John Doo the Magician is produced and directed by Cyril Umbrister. The makers of White King invite you to listen tomorrow at this time when the story resumes. John Doo the Magician. 
This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.